The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. Tonight on In Search Of, a savage beast brings terror to this lonely stretch of road. Many believe that the attacker is a werewolf. And can a curse that is nearly 3,300 years old still be blamed for numerous tragedies? We'll go in search of King Tut's curse. Has justice finally caught up with the world's most notorious skyjacker? We may have found D.B. Cooper. The Titanic sank nearly nine decades ago, but this man claims he went down with the ship. Oh, oh God, Johnny, look out! We'll hear his shocking story in search of reincarnation. I'm Mitch Pileggi, and this is In Search Of. Can a full moon trigger a transformation in man, making him a savage beast? A series of brutal encounters and medical discoveries have revived this chilling notion. Once a relic of drive-in horror movies, the legend of the Wolfman has jumped from the screen into the headlines. Come with us as we go in search of werewolves. Doctor, please! I know they're gonna catch me, but don't let anyone see me like that! Please, Doctor, help me! It's very real. It's something we need to look at. It's frightening. We didn't know if the if the authorities actually believed in this werewolf story, but that they had just issued us silver bullets. It looks back and glares at them as if to say, you can't do anything to me. I felt like I was lunch. I felt I was done for. The image of the werewolf has long been the focus of many Hollywood creep shows. Gnashing teeth, razor sharp claws, and the notion that a human could shape shift itself into this terrifying creature kept moviegoers on the edge of their seats. But werewolf tales have always been based on the fear that these monsters may be real. It's no surprise that werewolf lore still permeates the villages of Transylvania. But recent news reports indicate that werewolves may actually be stalking the forests of North America. This is rural Wisconsin, a peaceful place. But there is something in the woods here that has the tiny community of Walworth on edge. They have felt the presence of a beast. They keep a watchful eye open for the Bray Road werewolf. It's hard to imagine on this bright spring day that anything spooky could have happened in this spot here on Hospital and Bray Road. Linda Godfrey is a newspaper reporter in the Walworth County area. Her news column covers everything from births to business. But it is her inquiring mind that has made her the local authority on the creature that roams these woods. We still weren't sure if it was really a story. And then upon a little bit further investigation, I found out that our county um, animal control officer actually had a manila file folder marked werewolf in his file drawer at the office. It had the names and uh, phone numbers and um, messages from people who had been calling him saying, I saw this thing. I don't know what it is. It's tall. It has a dog wolf head. Um, the closest thing I could think of is a werewolf. Linda's dogged detective work has led her to many eyewitnesses of the strange creature. But over the years, her sources have chosen to clam up rather than open up to public ridicule. According to Linda, 
one woman had a particularly shocking encounter. This woman was driving right along the roadside when she saw something sitting or kneeling by the side of the road. She slowed down to take a look, thinking maybe that a person was hurt, and she realized it was no person. She described a dog or wolf-headed creature, but larger than you would expect an animal like that to be. And in its large, upturned palms of its hands, she could see there were claws, and it had a piece of some kind of dead animal. She was just immediately terrified. This woman said that if there was such a thing as a werewolf, this is probably what it would look like. This account of the Bray Road werewolf reflects the typical sighting. However, at least one witness claimed that the creature has an aggressive nature. This was a woman who was a senior in high school. She was driving down Bray Road very late at night, and her car kind of, she felt it bump over something. She wanted to make sure that she hadn't, um, you know, actually hit someone. She got out, turned and looked around, and she could hear this boom, boom, boom of heavy feet hitting the pavement, and she saw a form in the darkness. Some kind of creature on two feet that began running toward her. Afterward, she vowed never to speak of the incident again. Even local Walworth law enforcement has had their fair share of wild reports. Well, I've been here ever since the legend started. It's always been unexplainable. Lieutenant Ron Person has been a sheriff in this county for 30 years. He is a no-nonsense lawman who does not believe in the existence of werewolves. Police officers always think that everything's explainable, has to be explainable. Um, in a case like this, if you're going to believe in it, it's unexplainable. There's definitely a lot of things that I can't see that do exist. And I believe that God exists, and I've never seen him or that particular being. And there's a possibility, I suppose, if one were to stretch their imagination, that werewolves could exist. And just in case they do. That's a 357 silver tip towel point bullet that our department issued to us at the same time that the werewolf story was running rampant in the papers. In a neighboring county, a similar creature has been spotted. Jessica Anderson came face to face with a form that will haunt her forever. We stood out here all summer, and um, you could watch the deer come by and everything. And in August, suddenly, everything stopped. I was sleeping in the bed. I woke up suddenly, and I sit up, and I look out. I see this thing. It had a wolfish face. It was standing upright, and it looked to be clawing at the window. Anderson noted something different, and perhaps telling about the wolf-like creature she saw. It looked starved. It looked like a starved, wolfish-looking creature. I felt like I was lunch. I felt I was done for. There is no evidence that this creature is of supernatural origin, and that leaves room for an intriguing theory. Could it be that the Bray Road werewolf is an evolutionary fluke with ties to a much more distant past? Ancient Greeks described a race of werewolves five centuries before the birth of Christ. They talked about the Nuri being a people or being that would once a year turn into werewolves. And if you look at some of the old legends from ancient Greek, you find that uh, they actually spoke of werewolves being part of the Olympics. Dr. Lauren Coleman is a cryptozoologist and author of Mysterious America. As an expert on ancient cultures and the werewolf phenomena, he offers this theory on the ancient Greek stories of werewolves. I think that it may be a remembrance to Neanderthal, that there may actually have been survival of Neanderthal late into uh, some of the historic times, and these more hairy creatures coming from the hills, 
being a little more ferocious than the Cro-Magnon may have uh, given rise to some of the werewolf legend. Is it possible that werewolves are evolved Neanderthals that have slipped through the fabric of modern civilization? Science has yet to prove such ideas, but the medical community recognizes that there is a werewolf disease and has even given it a name. Lycanthropy is really the belief that you are a werewolf. It's a psychological disorder. People really believe, either in their dreams, imaginations, out-of-body projections, all kinds of different ways, that they do become werewolves. The delusions of lycanthropy can't explain the monstrous appearance of the Bray Road Beast. Could it be a missing link to prehistoric man? Do werewolves really exist? The truth and the beast may lie hidden beneath human skin until the next full moon. Coming up, did the world's most daring skyjacker lift to bury a fortune in cash? The answer may come from this woman who claims she married D.B. Cooper. And later on the show, do you believe in reincarnation? This man does, and he may have shocking facts to prove his case. But first, is a 3,200-year-old curse still claiming lives? We'll go in search of the answers. The mysteries of Egypt endure more than 4,000 years after the pyramid tombs rose in the desert. But some claim that the modern-day violation of one pharaoh's crypt may have unleashed an ancient terror. Is the curse of King Tut still claiming lives? The legacy of death triggered by the opening of his tomb lives on to this day. The answer may be found in a villa in northern Italy, our first stop in search of the mummy's curse. January 2001. A former model and millionaire socialite is found dead after disappearing from this luxurious Italian villa. That villa was once the property of a wealthy British lord who had financed the excavation of an ancient tomb. He was paid back with sudden death. The wealthy lord was assisted by an Egyptologist who laughed at a legendary curse and fell victim to a lethal illness. Could these three actually be victims of the mummy's curse? In 1922, Englishman Howard Carter made one of the most amazing archaeological finds in history. After years of painstaking effort in Egypt's famed Valley of the Kings, he had finally captured the treasure that had become his obsession, the tomb of King Tutankhamun. He had told his diggers to excavate deeper than before because his suspicion was that the tomb lay much further down. So his diggers were at work and suddenly they came upon a single step and Howard Carter immediately realized that this was probably it. After making the discovery, Carter resealed the entrance to Tutankhamun's tomb, placed guards around the burial site and waited for his English sponsor, Lord Carnarvon, who had financed the expedition. Amid the excitement came the first ominous warning of the mummy's curse. Carter had recently purchased a yellow canary. The workers on the tomb believe that the canary brought them great luck. But unfortunately, when Howard Carter was gone, a cobra came in and devoured the canary and swallowed it whole. Word leaked out to the workers that this had happened, and they were terrified because they saw the cobra as a symbol of the kings of, of Egypt. And they felt that the cobra was Tut's representative on Earth who had just destroyed the people who had violated his tomb. Soon after, Lord Carnarvon arrived from England, and the team entered the tomb. Howard Carter went in first. By candlelight, he peered in, and a very excited Lord Carnarvon said, do you see anything? And he said, yes, wonderful things. 
and he could see in there all of the treasures through the doorway, and he was only seeing a portion, a very small portion of what was there. What Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon viewed in the flickering candlelight, no human eye had seen for nearly 3,300 years. The monumental discovery soon became an international sensation. Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon were suddenly famous. But as their fortunes soared, tragedy struck Carnarvon with a fatal blow. He was bitten by a mosquito, and the bite got infected. He developed a fever of 104, and at that point started to deteriorate rapidly. The wound never healed, and a specialist flown into Cairo arrived too late. Carnarvon died seven weeks after the official opening of the tomb. The world press immediately saw in the tragic end of Carnarvon a sinister new beginning, that of the mummy's curse. The Egyptians use curses in a wide variety of ways. Our first examples are actually drawings or representations on walls of temples and tombs designed to perpetuate the defeat of an enemy. Controversy surrounds the curses believed to have been found within the tomb of Tutankhamun. There's some mystery surrounding two artifacts that were found in the tomb that are related to the curse. They were a tablet which had a warning that death would come to anyone who entered the tomb and disturbed its artifacts, and a statue which was the image of the protector of the tomb. The workers were extremely frightened, very worried about the curse. They were convinced they were going to die, and some of them were fleeing. The workers' fears were soon confirmed as many others associated with the tomb began to die. Thirteen dropped dead from fever and illness, including Arthur Mace, an archaeologist who helped unseal the tomb. Lord Carnarvon's secretary, Richard Bethel, died under mysterious circumstances. Bethel's father, obsessed with the curse, committed suicide while others fell victim to tragic accidents. Dr. James Breasted, a prominent Egyptologist, described the curse as Tommy rot. I defy the curse, he declared. I slept in the tomb for two weeks and even had my meals there. I never felt better in my life. One year later, he was dead, the victim of a mysterious illness. Unwilling to believe that a curse could possibly be the source of so many deaths, some experts point elsewhere. People believe that the deaths that some people attribute to the curse of Tutankhamun actually has a scientific basis. And this would be that people were poisoned by spores and molds that are associated with mummies. But obviously there were very many deaths where the people were not inside the tomb. So you still have to account for those. Even if you say, yes, I believe that a disease is at work, you still have to account for those remaining deaths. By 1939, Tutankhamun's remains were placed back in his tomb after 17 long years of examination. For nearly three decades, the curse would lie dormant until a decision was made to interrupt the king's eternal rest once again. Tut's royal possessions, meant to accompany him on his journey to the next world, were to go on a world tour. Mohammed Ibrahim was Egypt's director of antiquities. In 1966, there was a director of antiquities in Egypt that was concerned about the artifacts from the tomb going on exhibit. He went to the French government, who was planning to do this exhibit in cooperation with Egypt, and tried to convince them not to do it and they refused, and when he walked out of that meeting, he was struck and killed by a car. After the world tour, Tut's possessions were returned to the Cairo Museum, where they remain to this day. For many, the horrors of the mummy's curse seem to have finally ended, or have they? More recently, the mysterious death of Countess Francesca Vaca Augusta led some to blame the curse of Tutankhamun. A beautiful model and wealthy heiress, the Countess lived in the Italian villa that had been the family home of Lord Carnarvon for generations. She disappeared from the villa January 8, 2001. 14 days later, 
her body washed ashore in France. According to one local historian, another female relative had died in a similar fashion, and some claim that Carnarvon had brought King Tut's curse to the villa. Howard Carter, the man most responsible for the opening of the tomb, did not escape unscathed. He died in 1939, disillusioned and exhausted. Prior to Carter's discovery, Tutankhamun had been a minor pharaoh forgotten by history. Today, he is the most famous of all the ancient Egyptian kings. Tut's fabulous treasure and legendary curse have given the dead king what he wanted most in life, immortality. Later on In Search Of, watch this man relive the final moments of his life during one of the most infamous tragedies in history. But first, he cheated death with the boldest robbery ever attempted, but his luck may have just run out. In Search Of D.B. Cooper, next. It was one of the most brazen crimes in American history. With $200,000 and a parachute, D.B. Cooper made the leap from skyjacker to folk legend. Now, a shocking deathbed confession may lead to a buried fortune and solve the mystery of D.B. Cooper. A dogged FBI agent, an intrepid investigative reporter, a veteran skydiver, and a determined housewife. All of these people have something in common. Each may hold the key to solving one of the biggest mysteries of the 20th century. The story of D.B. Cooper begins on November 24th, 1971. Northwest Orient Flight 305 had taken off from Portland, Oregon, en route to Seattle, Washington. A man wearing a dark suit, sitting in seat 18C, handed the flight attendant a note. It said he would blow up the plane if he did not receive $200,000 in cash and four parachutes when they touched down in Seattle. The man in seat 18C called himself Dan Cooper. The FBI was contacted and Ralph Hemmelsbach was one of the first agents assigned to the case. Ralph recalls what happened when the plane landed in Seattle. He permitted it to land. They put the parachutes and the money on board, refueled the airplane, released the passengers, and the flight continued, uh, took off, and headed for Reno, Nevada. During that flight, about 35 minutes after the aircraft took off, uh, the hijacker bailed out. What resulted was one of the largest manhunts in American history. Dan Cooper, whose name was mistakenly reported as D.B. Cooper, got away with $200,000. As time passed and the crime went unsolved, investigators hit a brick wall. For 24 years, the case remained dead until March of 1995. Florida antique dealer Dwayne Weber, dying of a kidney disease, told his wife, Joe an extraordinary secret he had been keeping for over 20 years. He says, come here, I've got something to tell you. And he kept wanting me to come closer. And he said, I'm Dan Cooper. I'm Dan Cooper. It's the way he said it, I'm Dan Cooper. He didn't say Cooper, Cooper. He got very, very angry. And he says, oh, let it die with me. Those were some of the last words Dwayne spoke before he died, and they left Joe confused until the day she coincidentally thumbed through a book on D.B. Cooper. The other thing that was in the book, they said that D.B. Cooper's name was not D.B. Cooper. The name given at the ticket gate was Dan Cooper. All of a sudden, the things he told me in the hospital made sense. I got one third of the way through the book, I was on the phone to the FBI. 
Joe also enlisted the aid of investigative journalist Doug Pasternak, who wrote an article for U.S. News & World Report about the Dwayne Weber, D.B. Cooper connection. I first got interested in this story when Joe Weber called me about three or four years ago, and she started putting the pieces of this puzzle together and wanted an investigative reporter to help her track some records down, where I helped steer her in the right direction. Hemmelsbach was struck by the eerie similarities between a photo of a young Dwayne Weber and the FBI composite sketch of D.B. Cooper. This is an artist's conception of Dan Cooper, and he also appears here wearing dark glasses. These are photographs of Dwayne Weber taken at different stages in his life, and there is some resemblance. Hemmelsbach believes that whoever Cooper was, he was ill-prepared to survive a jump from a 727. And he was wearing a business suit and slip-on loafers on his feet. He didn't have the items of personal equipment that he should have had for that jump. It is, in my view, and the view of most other parachute authorities, that he could not have landed uninjured. But Doug Pasternak found out that Dwayne Weber had been an Army paratrooper, and world skydiving champion Guy Manos has every reason to believe that Cooper was an expert skydiver. The skydiving community is very small, and back in the 70s, when the D.B. Cooper thing went down, it was an even smaller community. And so all of us that were jumping then were convinced that we must know who it is, because only a skydiver could even conceive of such a thing. Manos is convinced that the notorious skyjacker survived his jump. He's done it himself. I've got a uh, half dozen jumps out of a 727. Dwayne Weber would have been about the same age as the hijacker. And amongst the evidence discovered by Joe was an airline ticket she found that made Dwayne extremely nervous. We had some old tax records from 1990 that were just thrown in one big old box. I saw this ticket. It was a Northwest Airline ticket. It was from Portland to Seattle. I looked at the date. I said, God, this is an old ticket. He says, it doesn't mean anything anymore. One of the many secrets Dwayne kept from Joe was how much time he'd actually spent in the Pacific Northwest. Jim Stallings was a very good friend of Dwayne Weber's. And Dwayne Weber used to discuss with his friend Jim about living out in the Northwest. They used to have discussions about living in Portland back in the 1950s and 60s. This meant that he knew the Northwest. Again, it was something that his wife never knew. He had uh, once been uh, incarcerated at McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary in Washington. Joe recalls a nightmare of Dwayne's that seems strikingly real and had relevance to the Cooper skyjacking. One of the triggers was not just the description of D.B. Cooper, but when they mentioned the F stairs, I went berserk because immediately I remembered a dream that he had had, a dream where he was talking in his sleep. I left my fingerprints on the aft stair. Cooper made his exit via the back, or aft stairs. But Cooper jumped out of that plane with $200,000. What happened to the money? Startling information when we come back. This program contains images which may be disturbing to younger or sensitive viewers. Parental discretion is advised. On his deathbed, Florida antique dealer Dwayne Weber claimed to be the notorious Dan D.B. Cooper. If Weber was Cooper, and he survived the perilous jump from a 727, whatever became of the $200,000 that Cooper jumped with. A few days before Dwayne passed away, Joe and this woman he worked with as well were in his hospital room, and he blurted out, I buried $173,000 in a bucket, and I forgot where I buried the bucket. Joe couldn't find the bucket after Dwayne's death, but she did recall an unusual incident that may offer a clue. There was a road here. This is it. 
back in the fall of 1979, just about two years after they were married, they took a trip to the Seattle area and also drove down to Portland. And at one point, Joe remembers they drove down a dirt road, Dwayne stopped the car, he asked her to stay in the car, he walked down to the river, and she was in the car for about 10 minutes, and he came back. She didn't know anything about D.B. Cooper at the time or about her husband's criminal past or anything about that. But a few months later, a boy in the area digging a fire pit discovered $5,800 from the D.B. Cooper ransom money. It was the only money ever recovered from the hijacking. No more physical evidence has been discovered. So the search for conclusive proof that Dwayne Weber was Dan D.B. Cooper continues. If there was one question that I would ask him is why did you put all this on me? Why didn't you just go on? Why have I had to go through this for you? With a lack of physical evidence, experts today believe it would be hard to prove Dwayne Weber was really D.B. Cooper. Unfortunately, the only person who may have known the truth is no longer able to tell. Do you believe that this man lost his life in the sinking of the Titanic? He says he can prove it. Bill Barnes' shocking story, next on In Search Of. April 14th, 1912. Screams of horror mingle with the death rattle of a great ship as the Titanic begins her plunge toward the bottom of the North Atlantic. Bill Barnes relives that agony in vivid detail over and over again. The New Mexico resident believes that he sailed aboard the doomed ocean liner and died in the icy water. His story may provide striking evidence of reincarnation. And he's not alone. What if your memories were not your own? A certain smell or a certain sound or a certain color may, uh, for many people, stimulate a, a memory of perhaps a picnic or uh, something that they did in their life. Well, for me, these same triggers would stimulate a memory of something that had absolutely nothing to do with my present life. I recognize this place, and not as Bob Snow as whoever I was in that, in that body at the time. What if this life is just one in a series of lives that we've experienced through time? I always had it in the back of my mind that I had something to do with Titanic. I heard him literally shout out in his sleep, um, oh no, they need to use a new code, SOS. And you begin to wonder, well, what's going on here? Why do I remember this? Or why is this even here? It has nothing to do with my experience. It was so unbelievably vivid. It was almost it was as, as you were there. You were really there. You weren't just imagining it or seeing it. You were there. Under hypnosis, Robert Snow and Bill Barnes were taken back in time in a process called past life regression. I'm going to turn the hourglass upside down now, Bill. Many believe it is a way to tap into our subconscious knowledge of other lives we have lived. The body dies, but not the soul. The soul selects other bodies to keep coming back, back, and back, and back, until you do whatever it is that you were supposed to accomplish in this lifetime. Can the soul pass through bodies, taking with it tiny fragments of former memories? Are these subconscious images proof of reincarnation, the belief that we are destined to live many lives? Almost everyone has had a previous lifetime, but they forget it. Skeptics claim that past lives are nothing more than byproducts of overactive imaginations, spurred on by the power of suggestion. People wonder, are these experiences for real? Is it something that this mind has made up, especially under hypnosis? Uh, let me tell you something about a person under hypnosis. They don't know the next question you're going to ask them. And the emotion, difficult to fake emotions under hypnosis, one skeptic that tested the case for reincarnation was Robert Snow, captain of homicide for the Indianapolis Police Department. These kind of things don't happen to real people. I mean, they happen on the X-Files, they happen in movies and in books. 
things like this don't happen to real people. On a dare, Snow was persuaded to participate in past life regression. I didn't think I could be hypnotized. I thought, I'm much too strong-willed. There's no way to hypnotize me. But the hard-boiled detective was softened by the hypnotic words and found himself traveling back through time. Suddenly, Snow was in a studio, painting on a canvas. I could see I was painting a portrait. I could see, I could look down, I could see the brush of my hand. I was just putting the faintest touch on a portrait. Extraordinarily clear. I could see every brush stroke of this portrait. Snow was haunted by the images he recounted during his regression, but he was not convinced they were proof of a past life. Armed with a no-nonsense attitude and sharp investigative skills, he went in search of answers. So I started looking through the art books. I started visiting some art galleries. I searched and talked and checked with people for almost a year and never found anything. A year and a half later, he was ready to call it quits. But a fateful trip to a New Orleans art gallery changed everything. And I started to walk by. It's like I walked into a glass wall. I, I stopped so suddenly. It was the painting I'd seen myself painting as, as the artist. It was the woman I'd seen myself painting. The artist was James Carroll Beckwith, a little-known painter from the late 1800s. The last public exhibition of Beckwith's work was in 1912. Robert Snow could not have seen this painting during his current life. Even more shocking was the discovery of Beckwith's personal diaries. They proved without a doubt that almost every recollection Snow had under hypnosis actually happened in Beckwith's life nearly 100 years earlier. I found all kind of interesting parallels between Beckwith and myself. In his diary, other than his wife, he mentions two women he thought were very, very physically attractive. One was a Miss Morgan and one was a Miss Wolf. Well, I've been married twice. My first wife's name was Morgan when I met her. My second wife's name was Wolf when I met her. Makes you kind of give you chills. These parallels between a past and a current life convinced Robert Snow that he had been reincarnated. But Bill Barnes, a retired teacher from Arizona, had a different kind of past life experience. Since childhood, Barnes has had what are called spontaneous memories of another life. A life that ended with one of the most infamous disasters in history. You'll meet the man who claims he went down with the Titanic when we return. Is reincarnation possible? Are we destined to live again? And if so, would we cling to the memory of an earlier life? When I was between three and four years old, I began to correct my mother when she would call me Billy. And I would tell her my name was really Tommy. And at around that time, I started drawing pictures of ships on the walls to my mother's dismay, of course. And they all had four smokestacks. And I would tell her that this was my ship, but it died. As an adult, Barnes was plagued with relentless nightmares and a foreboding sense of doom. He finally sought help from clinical hypnotherapist, Dr. Frank Baranowski. When Bill came to see me for the first time, I listened to his story, and uh, I picked up a little bit that he possibly was frightened of water. And we were just going to go into that thing to see why he was terrified of water. I didn't expect what came out what came out was beyond belief under regression bill barnes discovers the secret buried in his subconscious memories what do you see well the shipyard how are you called sir well everybody calls me tommy how long do you think it'll take you to complete this this big boat you're working on now well there's two of them one of them is to go out in 11, and the other is to go out in 12. Which one is that in 12? Titanic. Barnes was Tommy Andrews, the shipbuilder of the legendary Titanic. Having a bad feeling about this ship. Bloody fool, you should have hit it head on. Should have hit what head on? The berg. There's a berg out there? We hit a berg. Well, look at this, there's a... She's listening, look at the gauge. She hasn't been 10 minutes. Is that dangerous? 
It means we're taking on a lot of water. Bruce Ismay was the financier behind the ill-fated floating palace. According to legend, he was motivated by money, not the safety of his passengers. What does Ismay say? He says, how can I, how can I know that? It's because I built the bloody ship. I know how she lives. I know how she's gonna die. Oh, good God, do not let her go down. Oh. My beautiful ship. Didn't let her sink. Not with all those people. I'm, I'm trying to hold on to the stern, but I can I cannot grasp it. What's gonna to happen to your ship? I'm never gonna see home again. Why do you say that? She's dead. As Tommy Andrews. Barnes witnessed one of the worst disasters of the 20th century. I did not completely believe I was Tommy Andrews. What convinced me was when I had taken all the elements of his life and put them into a historical timeline, and I found that at least 85, if not 95%, of what had occurred on the tapes had been recorded or at least matched up with a timeline for Titanic. Recent public fascination with the Titanic could account for Bill's recitation of certain facts. But how does that explain his unusual accent or intricate knowledge of early 1900s shipbuilding? The interesting thing about this whole subject of naval architecture is that my education has nothing to do with it. I can't even build a hen house right. I mean, I'm not, not really that, that good with tools. And yet I can look, just look at a model of Titanic or look at blueprints and start to say, well, this is why such and such happened. This is what this means. Now anchored safely in the present, Bill has written a book about his traumatic past life experience. I'm willing to risk being told you're crazy or to be ridiculed by people to say, this is, this is my truth. This is what I know to be right. And I don't care what anybody says. I know what I know. Are these stories confirmation that we have lived past lives? Like many policemen, Robert Snow was a hard-boiled skeptic. He is now a believer. The hardest part was changing your look outlook on the world, realizing that you've been wrong your whole life, that the world is not the way you think it is. As a teacher, Bill Barnes has devoted his life to the pursuit of reason and truth, and he is a believer. What you learn is that you're eternal. You know, you may die, but it's not gonna take away the essence of, of your life or the essence of what makes you who you are. Can the graceful skill of a long dead artist be reborn in the calloused hands of a tough cop? Has a dark moment in history been branded into this man's soul? In the form of Bill Barnes, it seems unlikely that Tommy Andrews will ever escape from the Titanic. And if Barnes himself hopes to find peace, he may have to wait for his next reincarnation. Thanks for watching In Search of. I'm Mitch Pileggi. Good night.